And church, we're going to get ready to go straight into the Word of God this morning. I've been sharing on the principle of generosity. I'm sorry that the word generosity evokes currency, the thought of currency. Now, the church is talking about giving and offerings. Please don't misunderstand even the partial apology that I am making. I am not ashamed or embarrassed to say that we need to give and give generously into the kingdom of God. I'm not embarrassed about that. My Father in heaven has given me everything. And I can't even begin to imagine what is waiting for us ahead. He is my health insurance. Thank you, President Obama, for Obamacare. But my God cares even more and he does a better job. He heals and he saves and he delivers. And no disrespect. I'm not saying that with disrespect at all. All the governments of the world try to take care of their people the best way they humanly can. But I thank God for a Father in heaven who overrides anything hell can throw at us and he overrides the natural circumstances of life. We are the apple of his eye and therefore we are constantly in his thoughts and constantly protected. Can I get an amen? I believe that with all of my heart. I believe that. If there's one thing that is true to me, it is how good God is. God is good. In the midst of adversity, I've had the wind blow. I've had my boat turned upside down. I've stared at death several times in my personal life with incurable diseases. And if there's one thing that I will not stop saying, it is this. God is good. He is a good God. And if you can hold on to the flagpole long enough while the wind is blowing and you're now at a uh, horizontal angle and you hold on to that flagpole, you will see the goodness of God. Can I get an amen? amen? Absolutely. So I've been talking about principles that govern the universe. I've spent many weeks on the principle of the power of our words. Now I've been spending at least three weeks or so on the principle of generosity. Generosity is an attitude. Generosity is an attitude. And generosity is about how well you welcome people into your life, how well you you love on people, how well you greet each other, how you care for one another, how you take care of your kids, how you take care of people that aren't your kids. Generosity is an attitude. When you serve the table, uh, at the table, do you invite visitors to your home? Do you invite them? Are you generous enough to invite people over for a meal? Someone said to me the other day, they said, Pastor Rob, we're looking forward to have you up for a meal. I said, I'm looking forward to coming. (laughs) Do you invite people over for a meal? If you do, do you just present the, the leanest and meanest and the meager offerings, or do you abundantly bless? Generosity is about a lot of things. How well do you tell people you appreciate them? How well do you praise and compliment? Generosity is a spirit. Do you know that poverty never goes hand in hand with generosity? Poverty is the offshoot of a stingy spirit. A stingy spirit will hold and tighten up, and poverty is what it gives birth to. Generosity is abundance, and it gives, and it brings prosperity. Acts chapter 20, verse 35, is a verse I read several weeks ago when I started the principle of generosity. And the Apostle Paul makes this statement, in everything I did, in everything I did, I showed you, he believed in being an example, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, he was diligent, he understood sacrifice, he understood that things cost. We want everything for free. This was a man who understood that he reaps what he sows, he has to work and work hard. By this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. If we're blessed, we got to be generous and bless those who are less fortunate than us. 
whether it's with a meal, an invite to our home, whether it's with hugs, with love, whatever it is, passing on clothes, whatever it might be, Paul says, I have shown you in everything that I've done, in everything that I've done, I've been an example, and I've been hard at work to help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus Christ himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Greed has three sisters. Their names are give me, give me, give me. And that spirit has never existed in heaven. It has no place in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God often teaches things that turns the natural world on its ear. It teaches things that are upside down. It's crazy, it's foolish. It's like Jesus saying, people despitefully use you, they persecute you, they talk bad about you. Bless them. Jesus said that. How am I going to be a preacher and stand here and not live by everything that is in the Word of God? I can't just preach or do the things that suit my nature. Do you think I like it when people talk bad about me? Of course not. Is it hard for me to bless them? Yes, it is. But the harder it is to bless them, the more I know that's the very thing I need to do. And even in that, we see generosity. While others are trying to take away from our name, take away from our reputation, take away from who we've been for all these years, and in one a slur of the tongue, they want to smirch your character. It's a generous spirit that turns around and gives goodness in return. If we want to be like our Father in heaven, generosity needs to become something that is a part of our character and how we do life. Listen, I'm going to say it again. If you want to be like your Father in heaven, then generosity has to become a part of our life. Do you know praying for people? We, we have prayer meeting here Wednesday night. I tell the folk who come and pray, I said, thank you. They're being generous. They're not coming to hear another pick-me-up sermon. They're not coming to hear a motivational speech on a Wednesday night. They're not coming to sit back and get blessed and recharged for the week. They come to pray. And praying, standing in the gap, means that sometimes we have to push off the powers of darkness. When we pray for other people in need, we're pushing off the powers of darkness off of their lives. Those powers of darkness could come knocking on our door too. When you pray, it's work. In a sense, it's work. While God does the work, we have to prevail. We have to pray. We give up our time. We give up our TV. We, put up, we give up that moment of putting our feet up on the lounge and just relaxing because tomorrow another day starts and it's hard. I want to tell you that prayer is generosity. And by the way, we as a church prayed and Laura Shannon, I believe that's Laura Shannon. Are you here? Stand up, Laura. This is the woman we just prayed for. Amen. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, one man gives freely, yet gains even more. You see, these are the things that, they don't make sense in the natural world. One man gives freely, yet gains even more. We've learned how to count. One plus one equals two. And two minus one equals one. And I'd rather have two than have one. You see, in the world, no, hang on. In the world, that's how we think. Something even as basic as learning arithmetic, we have learned the natural order. One plus one equals two. And two's better than one. And two minus one leaves you with one. But in the kingdom of God... Two minus one gives you five. The arithmetic of heaven is not the same as the arithmetic of earth. 
And we, we boggle at things like this. Listen, if you want a natural God and you want an ordinary God, go serve the world. But if you want to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, then believe in the supernatural principles that are generally the very opposite to the principles of this world. And if you want to be walking with a powerful and a mighty God who's intervening in your life, then live contrary to the principles of this natural world because only the principles of the supernatural world are the things that will take us into his presence. One plus one equals two. And two minus one equals one. But in the kingdom of God, it will equal five. One man gives freely yet gains even more. Another man withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. That's the word of God. Now I'm going to challenge you today. Do you believe that this book is inspired? Do you believe that every word of God is yes and amen? Do you believe God can lie? You see, I've been tithing for a long time, Pastor. What a sour puss. I've been tithing and giving to the church. Have you been generous in your heart? Have you been generous in your spirit? Are you generous to people around you? We think that we can latch on a one principle and not realize there are other principles. God wants us to tithe. God wants us to bring offerings. God wants us to bless his house. But he also wants us to give to the poor. He wants us to help people around us. You don't have to go far to find the poor. Anybody who doesn't have what you have, if they're in need, be generous. Be gracious. Be loving. A generous spirit, God will prosper. A generous man, don't think of only finances. A generous man, a generous man will prosper. A generous spirit, God will see to it. He who refreshes others, he who refreshes others. Oh my goodness, if we only understood that to be a Christian means that we have to live a life of refreshing others. You want to be a Christian? Live a life of refreshing others. You want to be a Christian? Take on your Father's heart and attitude and spirit and be generous. Be generous. Take out Mr. Grumpy out of your nature. Take Mr. Stingy or Mr. I'm afraid I'm going to lose it all out of your character. Fear doesn't exist in the character of God and stinginess and greed sometimes are there because of fear. Fear not. God is with us. My goodness, <laughs> I don't have to own a mint that makes silver coins. I have a father who owns the universe. Yeah, go on, give the Lord a clap. It won't go to my head, he wrote this stuff. Look at Proverbs uh, nineteen seventeen. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. Stop. If God's just going to give you back what you lent, that's not a reward. Everybody say after me, that's not a reward. If I give to the poor a hundred dollars and God gives me back a hundred dollars, he just gave me back what is mine. That, that, that's morality. That's justice. God didn't say I'll give it back to you. He said I'll reward you. 
Why are we stingy with our words of praise? Why are we stingy with our hugs? Why are we stingy with our time? Why are we stingy with our homes? Why are we stingy with our food? Why are we stingy with our finances? God says give and and it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running out all over. Now Jesus said that in the Gospels. Here we are in the Proverbs and he says that if you give to the poor, you lend to God and you you'll get rewarded. In other words, what you gave will come back and it'll come back with a reward. And reward's not always money. This is not the gospel of finances. Again, finances play a prominent role in the Bible. I'm not going to apologize for that. Just like finances play a prominent role in your day-to-day life. If it plays a prominent role in your day-to-day life, Of course it's going to be prominent in the Word of God. The Word of God is relevant to -to day-to-day life. But I'm talking about generosity as a spirit, being generous in everything we do. And when we give to the poor, we're lending to God. How many of you know the Bible verse that says, God is no man's debtor? So if you lend to God, is He going to be in debt to you? No, he's no man's debtor. Why? He's going to give back with interest. He's going to give back with interest. We live in a secular world, so we've only learned how to see the blessing in dollars and cents. I want to tell you that I give, and I give generously. And I believe that there are many blessings in my life that money cannot buy. Money will never buy. In fact, the most precious things are the things that money has no way of purchasing. Are you hearing me? You want good health? Be generous. Because rewards includes God touching you physically keeping you from hereditary uh, sicknesses or curses. It means God, in the midst of a very negative doctor's verdict, will be your healer, and he'll be your provider. Can I get an amen? amen? Let's go to the next verse very quickly. Thank you, guys. Proverbs 28, 27, He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. This is talking about the spirit of generosity. The spirit of generosity. I want you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter 10. I want to share a story with you. That one you first read it, and I'm sure you've read it before. The thought of generosity would never necessarily come to mind. It's a story about a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Jasmine, Brian, at this point in time in history, officially the gospel had not yet come to the Gentile world. God was getting ready to bring this amazing grace to the whole world. The prophets had prophesied that through Yeshua, the Messiah, the promised seed of Abraham, that God would bless the whole world. This Jesus Christ, the Yeshua, the Messiah, the one sent from heaven, God who clothed himself with flesh and came to earth, came not just to save the people of Israel, he came to save the whole world. And here was Cornelius. He was a God-fearing Roman centurion. He believed in the God of Abraham and Isaac. He became a convert at some point. But we knew he wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. The Bible makes it clear. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. By the way, let me say it now and get it out of the way. When the gospel came to the Gentile world, the first band of people it came to were the Italians. That's because we needed more saving grace than anybody else. He and all his family were devout. They were God-fearing. Look at this next line. He gave generously. 
to those in need. And he prayed to God regularly. This is a generous man. Not just because he gave to those in need, because he prayed regularly. You understand that a prayer life is being generous towards God. If that prayer life is only ever about you, no, uh, you're praying to an idol. It's called self. Well, they teach us at church to pray, so I pray all the time. And I'm always praying for the things I need. If that's all you ever pray for, you've made an altar to an idol and it's called self. The spirit of prayer is when you're taking time, you're praying for people you barely know. You're praying for somebody else. I got to tell you, you heard last week about Jay and you heard about Tatiana. And as a result, Sunday morning, we prayed for Jay and Tatiana. And as a result of that prayer, two days later, Jean calls me and says, three breakthroughs. Then I get a text today saying they've taken her off the machine. We have uh, um, Charles, a tall, gray-haired, thin young, uh, thin young man, gray-haired and young, like me. He usually sits about here, had back surgery this week. When we all came out the front to pray last Sunday, in his head, in his mind, he said, you know, God, as much as I'm having surgery this week, give Tatiana and Jay my blessing. Generous. I went to see him in the hospital the day of his surgery, and he told me this. And I smiled and I laughed and I said, Charles, you know, I understand what you did and that was very generous of you. Here you're about to have back surgery this guy's got more nuts and bolts in his body. He used to be a linesman and had several falls, and he's got so many bolts and screws in his body. And he's about to have surgery because he's been in incredible pain. And he's out here and he's saying, God, these people's needs are greater than mine. You know where you really see generosity? When you have a need yourself and yet you give. Generosity isn't giving out of abundance. Generosity is really dividends when you're giving out of your own need. Amen. So Charles said, he was telling me at the hospital that he prayed for them. And the first thing he did was ask me how they were. He's in hospital, had back surgery. He's asking me how they were. And I told him the good news, and he was genuinely excited. But here's the second half of that same story. Charles had surgery before I went to visit him earlier in the day. He did so well, a two-inch incision in his back. He did so well, he had already walked the corridors, uh, the hallways of the hospital, and they sent him home that night. Give, and it'll be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running out all over the place. And so here's Cornelius. He gave generously to those in need, and he prayed to God regularly. One day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, now listen. An angel of God comes. The man has a vision. And the angel says, Cornelius. Cornelius st stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. And the angel said, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. God keeps a, a record of our generosity or our greed. His life, praying constantly, being a man of prayer, he was generous. I'm sure this guy who prayed for the needs of other people, he was a prayer. It became a memorial in heaven. There's a record. There's a monument with his name on it. This man is like his father God. He is generous in nature and spirit. And because of his generosity in prayer and his generosity in giving, the Bible says God 
privileged him with a vision and a visitation. But it's even more than this. It goes on and he says, the angel says to him, um, <clears throat> Uh, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who's also called Peter. He is staying with Simon the tanner, whose house is by the sea. So Peter, the apostles, having a few days of meditation and rest at a house near the sea at, by si uh, Simon the tanner, one of the other believers, and when the angel who spoke to Cornelius had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. And he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey approaching the city, Peter, who was reclining, resting, meditating, went up to the roof to pray. It's amazing what happens when we're generous even in prayer. I love seeing miracles. I see a lot of miracles. This church, for its small size, we have seen so many miracles from day one. And it's partly, largely, due to the generosity of people every Wednesday night. They don't stay home, they come and pray. You notice it made a monument in heaven. The generosity of prayer. Not a monument of praying for ourselves, but praying for others and ourselves. Amen? Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> what happens is, about noon the following day, they get on the way, and Peter goes up to the roof, and Without reading all the verses, Peter's up on the roof and he has a vision. And in this vision, he's hungry. And he starts to see all different kinds of animals. And God says, kill and eat. And he says, God, I can't kill that animal. That's an unclean animal. According to Hebraic law, that animal is unclean to eat. And God said, what I've made clean is clean, kill and eat. And again, he sees the vision, kill and eat. And Peter says, I can't. And God says, what I've made clean is clean. He said, and then it goes on. It says, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, verse 19, while he's still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs and don't hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So Peter has this vision. Whatever I have made clean is clean. You can partake now. In other words, yes, that's part of the Hebrew law. But I am telling you under this new covenant, what I've made clean is clean. Peter goes downstairs and here are these two people from Cornelius' household and one of his dedicated soldiers. Now you have to understand they're Gentiles. And by Jewish law, and if you read the story, it says it. By Jewish law, they shouldn't even enter the house of a Gentile. They shouldn't have fellowship with a Gentile. You read the story. And Peter says to these people, what do you want? He says, well, uh, our master, Cornelius, had a vision. And God told him to send us to you to bring you back to his house. And so Peter invites them in. It says it. He invites them in. They didn't leave straight away. They left the next day. He invited them in and gave them a meal and gave them a place to stay. That was contrary to Hebrew law. But Peter just saw a vision. Eat. What I've made clean is clean. You see, what's powerful about this is that this is the turning point where the gospel now was being commissioned to go to the whole world. The disciples heard Jesus say, you'll be disciples, you'll be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. But conceptually, they never took hold of the fact that God's actually going to save Gentiles. Peter had to get a direct vision, otherwise he never would have gone to Cornelius' house. 
And if you read the story, it's all in there. He, it says, Peter explains, by law, I shouldn't enter your homes, your Gentiles. But I saw a vision from God. The next day, Peter sets out with these servants and goes to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius had gathered a group of friends and family members because he knew Peter was going to come. And obviously, God has something to say to this man, Peter. And Cornelius was excited. He gathered up his friends. Evangelism. He was generous. Watch this. Do you know that evangelism is the result of a generous spirit? You have received eternal life. You have a mansion waiting for you, gold streets. You're going to be given positions of authority. You're going to have great pleasure in heaven. Evangelism is sharing that good news with other people so that they'll get as blessed as you. Evangelism comes out of a generous spirit. So here's Cornelius. He just had a visitation from an angel. He obeys. He sends for Peter. And then he calls everybody. I don't want to be the only one who's going to hear from God. This man has got something so important that an angel appeared to me. I want everybody I love. I want everybody I know to hear this message. And Peter walks into a Gentile home and here's Cornelius with his whole household, his relatives and his friends and they're waiting to hear from Peter. And Peter walks in and Cornelius falls at his feet and starts to honor him. Gee, I don't want you falling at my feet but we sure could use a little bit more honor for the men of God. I've never been one to look for your praise and I've always, if anything, made myself as ordinary as everyone else. But we're living in a day where it's harder and harder for people to give honor. Peter turned to Cornelius. He said, I am as you are. Please stand up. But look at Cornelius' heart, generosity, even in bowing down and hugging Peter's feet. What you're seeing is a generous spirit. True worship comes from a generous spirit. True evangelism comes from a generous spirit. Generosity is not about money. Generosity is a character and an attitude, and it is a spirit. Good preaching, Pastor Rob. Good preaching. He says to Cornelius, why did you send for me? Cornelius tells his story. Then Peter turns to the people. He says, I'm a Jew. By law, I shouldn't be here. But let me tell you my story. Two men had a visitation from God. And after Peter finished preaching about Jesus Christ, the Bible says that the Spirit of God fell on everyone that was present and they believed and they received the Holy Spirit and began to speak in unknown tongues. The gospel officially was launched into the Gentile world and what brought it there was a spirit of generosity in a man called Cornelius. Your generosity in prayer and your generosity in tithes and offerings and giving, your generosity in kindness, you have no idea how it unleashes God's hand to do good. And our poverty mentality, because poverty is a mentality before it's ever a fact, our poverty mentality shuts up the windows of heaven. Are you hearing me today? God keeps records of our generosity or our greed. He said through an angel, Cornelius, your constant praying and your gifts and help to those less fortunate than yourself I've become a memorial in heaven. There's a monument with your name on it. And it says generosity. And because of that, this man became greatly favored in God's eyes. 
I urge you, I encourage you, if you really are a Christian, if you really love Jesus Christ, if you come here because God is your Father and Jesus is your Savior, imitate Him. And He is a generous God. Will you stand with me? In a moment, I'm going to open the altar for continued worship for those who want, those of you who need to leave in a moment. I'll give you that opportunity. But we're going to also open the altar for the sake of praying for you, the congregation. My pastors are going to come forward. Pastor Haas and Linda are going to come. Pastor Sam and Jenna are going to come. I'm going to ask if Reverend C, Rev C, We'll come together with Vicki. In fact, would you guys come now? Would you do that? Before I open the altar to the whole church, friend, hear me. Everyone listen to me. God's generous. If I could paint a picture, we as human beings have been less than kind to God. We've neglected him. We've ignored him. The most important person in the world. If Bon Jovi walked in, we'd all be amazed. We'd all, you know, out of fascination, we'd probably want to see him, touch him, talk to him, maybe even get a signature. And then the creator of the whole universe, as mere human beings, we have little thought for him. And in the midst of our sin, our arrogance, Our selfishness, God generously loved us and loves us. God so loved the world that he gave generous. See, he's generous. God so loved. How did he love the world? Generously. He so loved the world that he gave. And what did he give? A retired, broken down, old aged angel. No, he gave himself clothed in flesh. The Bible says that every one of us are sinners. We've all made mistakes and we've all done wrong. But the Bible also says God loves us. If you want to make a generous act, generously accept God's love for you. Generously accept the fact that Jesus Christ died on a cross. If you have never welcomed Jesus Christ in your heart, friend, I could preach a gazillion motivational messages or even good spiritual truths like this, and they can benefit you. But the greatest thing that will benefit you is letting Jesus Christ come into your heart and letting him be your Lord and Savior. Sometimes people hesitate because, well, if God is good, why this? Why that? Why... Listen, don't wait till you figure it all out. Let him in and he'll help you figure it all out. With every eye closed right now, if you're here today, whether it's for, you've been here for the last three years or you've been here for one or two times or your very first time, God wants you to accept his generosity. If you've never asked Jesus in your heart, raise your hand right now. Quickly. Say, I want to accept Christ as my Savior. I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. Amen. Could I have Steve? Can you come, please? Quickly, just gently, politely, courteously, turn to someone next to you and ask them. My worship team can come up the front. Thank you. Turn to someone and say, do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Do you know Christ? I'm going to invite everyone who wants to stay for a little extended worship or you need prayer to start coming out of the aisles right now and come down the front. If you haven't raised your hand but you meant to and someone just talked to you, come on down the front. Church, the altar is open. We're going to go into worship. We're going to pray for those who need prayer. And for the rest of you, may God richly and generously bless you, especially as you start to mirror 
the character and the attitude of your Father. Father, I thank you right now. As we continue in worship, I pray your blessing on the whole church. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. If you are going to leave at this time, would you just do that quietly and respectfully? And others, quickly, come down the front. If you want to stay for a little bit of worship, you want some prayer, come on down the front. And our pastors are going to be praying with you and for you. Amen.